Thanks, everyone, for, uh, for being here. Last session, don't, don't die on me yet. Um, so I, you know, thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's, been, it's been an incredible day. Um, and I, what I wanted to do is, is um, talk about three interrelated things uh, that, that attempt to sort of build on some of the topics touched upon in the last session uh, from Dale and Kathy. Um, what I want to do is start by, by tackling a question really that looms over all discussions of, of child care, um, which is how expensive is it uh, and has it gotten more expensive over time? Uh, secondly, I will then sort of summarize what we know about the state of child care quality in the U.S. and try to tell some stories about why we have the quality we have currently. Uh, and then finally, I will end by describing uh, a, a particular kind of policy uh, aimed at improving child care quality. Um, and my main points really will be, will be the following. Uh, although uh, child care costs receive a lot of attention in the popular press, uh, and they are clearly a major burden for many families, uh, I want to actually disavow you of the notion that child care costs are the central problem plaguing the child care market. Uh, indeed, I will show you evidence uh, that for many families, costs have risen only modestly over the last couple of decades, uh, and, um, uh, um, and that rather um, child care quality is the primary problem. The market currently produces quality that is at too low a level, uh, that is mediocre at best, uh, and according to at least one metric, it has shown few signs of improvement over time. Uh, I'll then argue that one explanation for the low level of quality in the market uh, is really driven by something, by, by something called uh, uh, information asymmetries in the market, uh, in which parents find it difficult to distinguish between low and high quality care. Uh, and as a result, um, providers don't have much of an incentive to produce high quality care. Uh, and then finally, I'll end with a discussion of policy, uh, policy reforms around quality. Uh, in particular, I'll talk about what we know about the impact of quality rating and improvement systems, uh, which is sort of the predominant policy approach for improving quality. Uh, and what's sort of interesting about QRIS is that it may very well improve child care quality, but in doing so, uh, it may lead to more expensive child care. Uh, and so what I will do is, is sort of end the talk where I began essentially um, uh, by discussing sort of a, the, the outlines of a policy framework that attempts to tackle childcare costs, it subsidizes childcare costs uh, by, explicitly, by explicitly linking it with QRIS. Okay, so how, how have families' childcare expenses changed over the last uh, couple of decades? Uh, so here I compare uh, family expenses in 1990 with uh, 2011, the most recent year for which I have data, uh, using a large nationally representative sample of families with kids. Uh, and for both years, I show uh, the total amount that, that families are paying each week per hour that the mother is working. Uh, and the bolded numbers are the most important. That shows the percent change in, in hourly expenditures over time. Uh, and as you can see, uh, for families overall, uh, expenses increased from, from 227 to 259 per hour between 1990 and 2011, which corresponds to really a modest rise of, of 14%. Now, there are, are obviously, as you could see, really big differences uh, according to whether those families have preschool age kids and school age kids. So a rise of 29% versus a reduction uh, of 8%. Uh, so let, let's sort of... Um, dig into the preschool age numbers a little bit more, given that, that they were... Uh, I'm sorry, is, is that inflation-adjusted? Inflation-adjusted, yep. Uh, so let's dig into the preschool numbers a little bit more. Uh, so what I do here basically is use mother's education and family income uh, as the basis for making comparisons across disadvantaged and advantaged families. Uh, and I think these numbers are, are pretty striking. Uh, that is, low education and low income families have, have seen their, their child care expenses rise only modestly over this period, uh, while their high education and high income counterparts 
uh, have experienced uh, rather large increases. And I think actually the data on the, the bottom two rows uh, provides the most striking comparison. So disadvantaged families using center-based care uh, were paying 18% uh, uh, less in 2011 than they were in 1990, while their advantaged counterparts for the same kind of care were paying 23% uh, more. So what's, what's happening here? Why have childcare expenses increased only modestly for, for many families, in particular at the, at the bottom and middle, the, the, the bottom end through the middle of the income distribution? Well, I, I basically, I think there are sort of four hypotheses. Um, first, sort of a stylized fact in the data, but, but this especially holds for low-income families, is that families today are actually less likely to be paying for childcare. That is, among those who are using non-parental care, they're more likely to be using unpaid forms of childcare. Secondly, uh, I think that it's, that it's possible that the sort of increased investments in public pre-K, Head Start, and childcare subsidies uh, have sort of neutralized some of the growth and expenses that would have occurred in the absence of these programs. Third, uh, I think another stylized fact in the data is that starting in the early 2000s, as, as I think Kathy pointed out, uh, mother's labor force participation rates and children's childcare enrollment rates suddenly stopped growing. And what this means is uh, that the demand for childcare has likely been stagnant for over a decade. Finally, uh, and, and sort of consistent with the stagnation in demand, the evidence suggests that the market price of childcare uh, has been flat as well since the early 2000s. Uh, and so uh, here's, some, here's some data which I think sort of supports the argument that market prices have been flat. Um, what I show here uh, uh, is the trend in, in earnings for childcare industry em employees at various skill levels between 2000 and 2015. Uh, and I use the trend in earnings to proxy the trend in market prices because childcare is, is such a labor-intensive industry that my argument is the direction in which wages are headed will tell you something about the direction being taken in market prices. And so basically what you see here is a lot of flat lines. Childcare employees have not seen a, a, a raise in well over a decade. And because the earnings of childcare employees have been flat, uh, my contention is the market price of childcare has been, has been flat as well. Okay? So before I move on, I, you know, I, I, I want to sort of pause here to say that uh, my read of this evidence, uh, which, which comes from a larger paper, is that, is that childcare costs may not be the most pressing problem. For many families, it may not even be a growing problem. Uh, and as I will start to unpack now, my contention is that quality is really the thing that, that, that we ought to be focusing on. Okay. So, you know, many of you are probably aware of some recent high profile case studies in the popular press highlighting examples of very low and, and in, some cases, in some cases dangerous childcare uh, quality. Uh, but a academics, uh, um, some are here, have undertaken lots of studies uh, which, which have sort of systematically measured quality and sort of informed our views on quality. Uh, and uh, the, the findings are not always positive. So for example, uh, researchers in the NICHD study of early childcare found that 42% of childcare settings na nationwide uh, are rated to be uh, poor to fair at best. Uh, and a National Research Council report uh, concluded that somewhere between 10 and 20% of early education settings uh, are, may actually pose serious risks to child development. Uh, especially troubling, uh, but, but perhaps not surprising, uh, is, the, is the sort of stylized fact that it's even more unlikely for low-income kids uh, to be attending a high-quality child care program. Our concerns over quality, as I think Dale touched on uh, a, a while ago, um, extend even to some state-administered pre-kindergarten programs. Uh, which are often thought to be among the very best early education programs uh, on offer in the US. Uh, and I have one more piece of information on this, uh, and that comes from the educational attainment of, uh, of center-based childcare workers. Uh, this is just one dimension, not, not necessarily even of quality, but, but to the production of quality, uh, but, it's, uh, but it's important, and in any case, it's information that we have available over a long period of time. 
So here uh, I show uh, the fraction of center-based workers uh, with a uh, high school degree or less, some college education, and a BA degree or more uh, between 1992 and 2014. The good news is, on the one hand, that the proportion of workers at the lowest levels of education, those with a high school degree or less, fell dramatically uh, over this period from 47 to 36 percent. But they have, but those workers really haven't been replaced by the most highly skilled workers, those with a BA, uh, whose proportion only increased from 21 to 25 percent over this period. Uh, as a point of comparison, uh, the proportion of, of, of females with a BA in all other industries increased over this period from 22 to 37 percent. So the bottom line here is that a working age female with a college degree today is less likely to choose childcare employment than her counterpart uh, uh, several, several decades ago. So um, why, why, why care, why all the fuss about quality? And particularly uh, for low income kids, why do we care whether childcare delivers high quality programs? Well, on the one hand, it's been talked about repeatedly today, uh, we have really good evidence to suggest that inequality in educational outcomes, as measured by achievement test scores, uh, emerges early uh, between low-income and high-income kids, uh, and, and, and is large and persists throughout the school age years. Um, more worrying, as Kathy pointed out, that this income-based gap in achievement appears to be growing over time. On the other hand, uh, we also have a, a large research literature which, which finds that, uh, that exposure to high quality programs, particularly for low income kids, can significantly reduce the gaps. So the best available evidence to date suggests that a one standard deviation increase in center-based classroom quality leads to about uh, a 14% of a standard deviation increase in cognitive ability test scores. Uh, even more promising, are some really high quality preschool and pre-K programs, in particular those uh, in Tulsa, Boston, and, uh, and, and, and New Jersey. And this research finds that one or two years of exposure to these programs uh, can reduce the achievement gap between low and high income kids uh, by anywhere from 30 to 40% at the start of kindergarten. So quality matters, and yet it is, it is often at, at very low levels. Uh, and so I, I think if we're going to try to fix the problem, we have to understand its origin. Uh, and in my view, uh, a key cause of the, of the quality problem relates to the presence of severe information asymmetries in the market. And sort of the theoretical explanation goes as follows. That childcare is a difficult product for parents to evaluate. Quality in particular uh, is probably the most complicated thing for parents to understand. Uh, and, and what this suggests is that even though parents may care a lot about quality and want to consume it, uh, they have a difficult time figuring out the differences between high and low, in, high and, and low quality programs. In other words, uh, child care is sort of a classic experience good. You only know how good it is until your kids consumed it for a while. And so um, uh, when parents are sort of behaving in this way, when parents can't make informed decisions, what happens is they tend to overconsume low quality care and underconsume high quality care. And when the demand side is sort of behaving in this way, on the provider side, uh, there isn't much of an incentive to produce it, especially if it's more costly to produce because there's no market reward for, for offering it. And so uh, what we have then is, is a market that's full of low to mediocre quality programs because they're the only programs in the market that, that, that can survive. Is there any evidence to suggest that these information problems exist? Um, it turns out that the way in which parents search for childcare uh, is, is pretty revealing. Uh, so we have really good new data from uh, the National Survey of Early Care and Education, uh, which tells us a lot about the way in which parents conduct the childcare search. We know that search durations for childcare are short. Uh, it's common for parents to consider only one provider before making a decision. Secondly, uh, parents, poor and wealthy alike, 
uh, rely primarily on friends and family for information about childcare while neglecting other sources of information. So what we have basically is a situation where we, we have equally ill-informed parties exchanging information on, on childcare options. And then finally, uh, when parents actually do go visit a child care provider, as it turns out, they're less likely to ask questions about the quality features of the program, so things like the curriculum and turnover, uh, than they are about other features of, of the child care provider. Finally, um, there is some evidence to suggest that parents may just may not be the most demanding child care consumers. So for example, one study of low-income parents in, in four states finds that fully 74% of parents rated their child care provider to be excellent or perfect. Uh, my own, in in my, my own recent work, uh, which analyzed about 50,000 uh, Yelp consumer reviews of child care programs, find sort of equally rosy assessments of child care. I find that 76% of parent reviews in Yelp are, are five-star five ratings of child care. There's also some really interesting direct evidence on, on, on these information problems. Uh, so uh, in, in 2007, uh, the economist uh, Naji Bokan published an interesting paper which analyzed data from the cost, quality, and child outcome study. Uh, this collected information on about 400 child care centers in four states and, and about 4,000 children and families. And the survey did something uh, pretty interesting. It had parents and essentially developmental psychologists uh, observe and measure the identical features of the child care centers so that parent and psychologist-based measures of, ch of quality could be constructed and compared. And the findings, I think, are pretty illuminating uh, and, and I think strikes uh, uh, is sort of consistent with the idea that parents aren't especially discerning. Uh, so the, the key finding is that parents consistently overstate the quality of their kids' arrangement relative to the developmental psychologists. So for example, parents rated uh, the, the, the quality of their kids' interaction with teachers to be 19% better than, than did the developmental psychologists. Uh, and parents rated the overall level of quality uh, to be 22% higher than, than the psychologists. So I think the bottom line from all this evidence is that parents are likely to be ill-informed, they may undervalue quality relative to other features of childcare, and that these information problems may, may, may be uh, wreaking havoc with, with childcare quality. Okay. Which finally gets us to remedies. Um, from a, pu from a public policy perspective, what, what I uh, contend is that the U.S. needs nothing short of a sea change in the way the public views child care. That is to put the goal of supporting parental employment on equal footing with the goal of maximizing child well-being. Uh, and one sort of almost laughably simple but, but potentially powerful way to do this is, is by way of an aggressive consumer education campaign. Uh, that really does three things. Informs parents about the benefits of high quality care, changes parent perceptions about what is to be valued in a provider, and gives them the informational tools to, to distinguish between low quality and high quality programs. In other words, what if we were to sort of enact a system uh, that lowered the cost of accessing and understanding information on local childcare options? Well, as it turns out, we have a version of this system it's called uh, th these Quality Rating and Improvement Systems, or, or QRIS, and 42 states and counting have, have such a system. These systems are essentially hybrids of, of accountability and incentive-based systems that measure and monitor quality with, re with really two goals, to raise the average level of quality in the market and, and, and sort of reduce the amount of variation in quality that exists uh, uh, from one sector to another. Uh, although essentially states have wide latitude on how to design their QRIS, um, what essentially happens, as, as most of you probably know, is, is uh, a couple of things. Uh, all states volunteer to undergo uh, uh, a, an evaluation in relation to an, a large number of childcare characteristics. Uh, based on that evaluation, providers are assigned a quality rating 
uh, in the form of stars or some, or some other numerical value. And then these program ratings are, are disseminated to the public so that parents can, can use them to inform their child care search. QRIS's theory of change suggests that uh, when a child care program participates in QRIS, uh, a combination of three things all working together uh, will, will theoretically lead to quality improvements. Uh, first, there are clearly defined actionable improvement activities that are undertaken for a program to advance from one level to another. Secondly, uh, there are powerful financial incentives put in place to make it easier for our programs to want to invest in these time-consuming and costly quality enhancements. And then finally, probably most importantly, there are reputational incentives involved. Uh, that is because consumers are made aware of the ratings and then can use this information to vote with their feet. The idea is that, uh, that competition is catalyzed uh, between providers that may improve uh, market-wide quality. So um, is there any evidence to suggest that, uh, that, that QRIS is working as intended? Uh, so basically what I'll do is I'll spend the rest of my time uh, walking you through what we know about the impact of, of these systems. Okay. So the first sort of key question, a first order question is, to what extent uh, do providers participate in QRIS? Uh, and, uh, and among those that do, do they uh, experience quality improvements over time? Uh, in some states, uh, QRIS is mandatory, but in those states where it is voluntary, uh, we, the data strongly suggests that per participation rates uh, uh, vary widely. Uh, and some of this may be driven by just how long the system has been sort of up and running in the state. So for example, it's, uh, uh, it's not surprising that in a state like North Carolina, whose QRIS has been running for a long time, uh, provider participation rates are a lot higher than in a state like Virginia, whose program only, uh, only got underway uh, uh, recently. In terms of quality improvement, there does seem to be pretty good evidence uh, that, that, uh, that there is rapid and widespread uh, upward, mo upward movement in, in the quality ratings, indicating that, 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 uh, that programs are improving with regard to quality. The second sort of key issue relates to parents. Uh, are they aware of QRIS? And are they using these systems to inform their childcare choices? Uh, well, some, a number of states have administered their own surveys, uh, uh, household surveys, attempting to get at these very questions. Uh, and again, it looks like, similar to provider participation rates, parent awareness rates varies dramatically uh, from, from state to state. Uh, another way to sort of assess engagement and, and parent awareness uh, is, to, is to examine the extent to which parents visit the QRIS websites in their, in their home states. Uh, and as far as I know, this information is not available. Uh, so one way to measure it is through uh, the, the volume of Google searches for the state-specific QRIS names. Uh, and this is actually something that I've d I did recently for a large number of states. Uh, for, for a paper that I, uh, that I recently published. Um, and so what I'm showing here are the, the Google search trends uh, just for Minnesota and Wisconsin uh, between 2013 and the present. Uh, and it's clear, at least from these two states, that there's at least steady uh, uh, search activity. In other states, there, there appears to be uh, increasing search activity. Um, and so I think when you put the, the, the small amount of evidence on parent awareness together, it suggests the, that the public may be gradually learning about QRIS, but I think there's, there's a lot of work to do uh, to make these systems more salient to parents' child care choices. Okay. Are the units What's that? Are the units uh, uh, it's, it's all benchmarked against, uh, so, so the numbers on the left are sort of benchmarks against the period which, which received the highest search activity. Yeah. 25%. Yeah. OK, so to that end, uh, I, I've recently done some work sort of directly trying to estimate the impact of QRIS enactment on families' child care choices. Um, my analysis sort of relies on the fact that states have introduced their systems at very different times 
And, my, and so what I've, what I've done is kind of exploited that temporal variation to understand how parents' child care choices have changed before versus after the enactment of, of QRIS. Uh, and I find that overall, parents do, in fact, uh, become more likely to use non-parental child care after enactment as, as opposed to before. But there are really big and interesting differences in terms of how this plays out across low-income and high-income families. So as it turns out, low-income families uh, are more likely to use uh, lower cost, potentially lower quality forms of, of informal care after QRIS introduction, while high-income families are more, are more likely to sort into a higher cost, high quality formal programs like, like center-based programs. This is obviously a really key finding. The split is, 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 is really key. Uh, and I'll sort of come back to it at, at the end of the talk and, and offer a, a, an explanation as to why this is happening. Uh, my work has also looked at the effect of QRIS introduction on uh, parental employment. The idea here is that given what I just said to you about the shift from, from parental to non-parental care, it's also likely that there's been a corresponding increase in maternal employment. The, the answer here is yes, there has been, but once again, the employment effects has really, really, been, help, really been, been focused on, on high-skilled mothers and not at all among low-skilled mothers. Finally, there are questions about uh, the child care workforce. Uh, what, what has sort of happened to them? Um, so given that many states have, have pegged their QRIS to increases in teacher training and education, one might expect there to be changes correspondingly in the composition of the child care workforce as well as teacher compensation levels. Uh, and my, my work sort of finds that QRIS has been a double-edged sword for the child care workforce. So on the one hand, uh, center-based providers, after the introduction of QRIS, hire more staff. Those teachers are uh, more highly skilled, more likely to have college degrees, and they're better compensated. Uh, but on the other hand, QRIS uh, seems to sort of, these positive effects seem to come at a cost of more churning, more, more turnover uh, in the labor force. Uh, possibly as a result of these new highly trained teachers coming in and replacing their, their less skilled counterparts. Now, there's actually sort of an interesting uh, wrinkle in my results when I, when I examine what happens uh, when these QRIS uh, systems are introduced alongside uh, uh, programs that, that compensate, that offer sort of wage compensation to childcare teachers. Uh, and what these wage compensation programs do is essentially offer like one-time or periodic wage supplements. Uh, and, and these programs exist in about 14 states. And they're important, the thinking goes, because they provide some backbone for allowing providers to sort of stand up the, the, the rest of their, uh, their requirements. Uh, and what I find is that when, when states have both programs in place, that is QRIS and these wage compensation programs, um, not surprisingly, the teachers in these states experience larger increases in compensation, uh, but the firms, the child care firms in these states, hire even more teachers, and these firms experience actually lower, uh, lower turnover rates. And so these results, I think, suggest that these wage compensation programs aren't just a nice add-on to QRIS. They may actually be central to their success, because essentially what they're doing is partially underwriting the costs for providers to undertake the rest of their quality improvement uh, activities. Okay, what I'm gonna do now is start to sort of wind down by pointing out, I think, some concerns and, and potential problems uh, uh, with, uh, with QRIS. Um, one, one key issue, I think, with QRIS is that it doesn't in and of itself mean that more kids will enroll in high-quality childcare, right? For that to happen, parents actually have to use the information uh, and sufficiently value quality to sort of alter their preferences. Secondly, uh, there has to actually be some high-quality programs available locally for parents to use, and those programs have to be affordable. And that's a lot of ifs. But I think two things in particular are, are concerning. Number one, I, I think competition between providers over quality may actually drive up prices in the market 
to the point where low-income families are, are priced out of the market. Think about that, those split results that I, that I talked about earlier. Priced out of the high-quality market, so they end up using lower-quality care. Uh, second, the second concern is that uh, although consumer education campaigns have a, have a solid record of success in other markets, including in the K through 12 sector, uh, it remains to be seen whether parents value childcare quality enough to be swayed by these rating systems uh, uh, to change their preferences. And I think on this, there, there is some cause for concern. Um, so first, some research finds that various measures of childcare quality do not in fact predict parent satisfaction with childcare. What seems to predict how happy parents are with, with childcare is how convenient it is. Okay? Secondly, uh, there is some anecdotal evidence that parents are using QRIS's quality ratings not as measures of quality, but as proxies for how costly it is. Um, If, if you can indulge me just for, for another minute, I, I want to editorialize a bit by, by making some quick comments uh, about what I think should be the focus of childcare policy moving forward. So right now, there's a tension between the sort of two, the two key goals of childcare policy. That is supporting parental employment and, and maximizing uh, child well-being. Uh, so programs like childcare subsidies have been effective at increasing parental employment while programs like pre-K and Head Start can be good for child development. But it's actually very difficult for, for these programs to accomplish uh, both goals for a variety of reasons. Uh, and I think the great promise of QRIS is that it takes childcare, which has been so important to, for parental employment, and, and it attempts to bring its level of quality in line with some of the very best early education programs on, on offer. Uh, and so I think the key missing link for, for policy, for childcare, it should be the focus of, of policy, is what are we going to do about childcare subsidies? And in my view, I think two things need to happen. Uh, first, the, the current subsidy system, which was created in 1996 alongside uh, welfare reform legislation, uh, and which serves only low-income families, and which imposes a, a work requirement on, on recipients, uh, should, I think, be divorced entirely from the welfare system, designed as a standalone program that serves family regardless of, of income and regardless of parental employment status. Secondly, I think that, uh, that subsidies should increase the incentive for parents to use high-quality child care. Uh, that is, the, subsidies, the subsidy payment really should be an increasing function of the quality of care used. That's, that's currently happening in, in states, not, not strong enough in, in my view. Uh, another way, one way to do that is to link the subsidy payment to the to program's QRIS rating. And so I'll just sort of end here by arguing that, that I think this is what a modern US-style child care, child care policy looks like. Uh, one that marries QRIS with a quality-based child care subsidy, making all of the incentives mutually reinforcing. It imposes accountability standards on providers, but, but gives them the financial incentives to improve quality, while giving parents the informational resources to make better choices, and puts their money, more money in their pockets so that they can go out and afford uh, uh, the, the best available uh, uh, child care programs. Thanks. Hello, uh, I'm Aaron Sojourner, standing between you and the reception. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk to you, focus a lot on cognitive skill, uh, but I totally appreciate that uh, other aspects of child development matter. Uh, I'm going to talk about a lot of different work, so there's a lot of different caveats here. A lot of my co-authors are in the room, uh, and you know this reflects a lot of people's work. Um, so I want to make a few points today. The first is that we ask the most of families when they have the least. This is a different argument than we usually make, uh, and I want to walk you through it. It's pretty basic, 
But I think it's really something fundamental uh, about families with young children. And if we take this perspective, I think it can help us uh, think better about what to do and how to move people uh, along. The second thing is uh, income-based cognitive skill gaps exist uh, under the status quo set of policies, but these are not inevitable. Uh, this point, many other people have spoken to already, so I'll probably hurry through this. Uh, you guys, I think, are pretty well persuaded, uh, at least of the first part. The last bit is that I think we have a, a lot, relatively speaking, we have a lot of evidence about the de about how child care experiences, early experiences, affect kids' development. We have a medium amount of evidence about how parents make choices about allocating their time and money to create those experiences for kids and to balance the family budget. Uh, and we have very little evidence about how we can scale up programs. Um, you know, we have these promising results from model demonstration projects, but when we try to take it to scale, it gets much more complicated. And we know very little about how the supply side of the market reacts to subsidies and different kinds of policy. And so I'll tell you a bit about some work that, to try to understand that. Uh, I think that's a really important frontier uh, for all of us to understand better. All right, so this is based on some work that I did when I worked at the uh, Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, this is a, a report you can find online. Uh, the idea is that we, families have the most private responsibility for uh, paying for their kids' care when their kids are young. This isn't, shouldn't be surprising to you. But they also, this is what's new, is that they also have the least private resources when their kids are young. And the public puts in the least resources when their kids are young. So um, it's a really terrible situation where we ask the most of families when they have the least. So let me go through some numbers. Um, we did our best to come up with a complete accounting of federal, state, and local m money going towards kids. So that includes childcare, schooling, health, nutrition, EITC, uh, like all ca cash transfers. Uh, and we did it basically to try to say how many dollars per kid per year are going uh, from the public towards families uh, as a function of the youngest uh, of the child's age. So uh, when the kid's in the first three years of life, it's about $9,000. And a lot of that is health. A lot of that's Medicaid. Uh, very little of it is actually uh, child care. Uh, when they're three to five, you start to see pre-K. You start to see um, state, yeah, state pre-K, early learning scholarships, that kind of stuff. There's a big jump once they hit kindergarten. And the K-12 system kicks in. So we spend, you know, 70% uh, more or something per kid year uh, once they're in elementary school than we do early on. We also took a look at this national survey of early childhood experiences. And it has a very nice child time diaries. So you can actually see the kinds of settings that kids are spending their time in in a nationally representative sample. Uh, and you can see properties of the, the, the settings that they're in. And so on the, basically we're looking here at the share of time that kids are spending in different kinds of settings during 60 hours a week, the standard uh, sort of business work week. Um, and like including commuting times and stuff. Uh, and this is the first year of life up to age 12. And the green bar tells you the share of time that they're primarily in the care of a parent. The gray bar tells you the share of time that they're primarily in the care of an unpaid friend, family, you know, something like that. The blue tells you the share of time that they're in privately financed care. So non like formal care, like a center or a, a family provider who's not a relative. And this little tiny orange slice over here 
is the share of time that they're in some kind of publicly financed ECE. So that's, C -cap, that's you know, CCDF, uh, that's CCAP, basic sliding fee. Uh, that's about it, early head start. I mean, it's such a tiny slice. So um, it's true that subsidies have gone up uh, over time, but they remain incredibly low for uh, young families. It's not, you know, once kids hit three or four, you start to see a little more. But on average, for kids under five, it's per kid, it's five hours a week of subsidized care. Once they hit uh, K-12 age, all of a sudden the public steps up with a lot of money and says, you know, we're going to help you take this off your plate. We'll provide a, a, a safe, uh, appropriate setting for your kid for about half the, half the time. So this, you know, includes summer. It includes, you know, a short day. So kids are still spending only about half of the time in school, uh, in public school. This is private school, parents, uh, you know, others. So there's this big shift uh, in the setting that kids are in. Okay, when kids are young, parents have less resources, private resources. So they have less public resources. I just showed you that. I'm going to show you they have less public, private resources too. When your kids are young, you're young. When you're young, you've had less time to work and save. Okay, so you have less past income. You also have less earning power than you will when your kids are older. You have less education, you have less work experience. And so we broke, we, we looked at nationally representative data by the age of the youngest child uh, in a family, and we calculated the uh, hourly wage and the usual hours of work. And so it, the zero is like, average across the whole age span of the child. And what you see is that um, when kids are young, their parents have lower earning power, much lower earning power than when the kids are older. And they have much less ability to work um, because they have a huge care responsibility. So they have less past income, less current earning power. We also documented this, which hadn't been documented before, that they have, less, they have lower credit scores. So they have more future income, but they can't access it. They have lower credit scores and they're credit constrained. So um, when your kids are younger, you can't access your future income either. So look, that's all the resources. Public resources are lower, private resources are lower. Past, current, future income, lower. <laughs> uh, what do we expect to happen? Um, and it's not like it's so cheap to produce care when kids are young. Either a, a parent has to stay home and give up work opportunity, which is very expensive uh, in terms of lost earnings, or you, know, you have to put the kid in a very small group with infant and toddler care. Later on, you know, I, teach, well, I teach college. You know, I have 60 kids in my, in my lecture, um, but you, know, you can't do much more than four if you're talking about infants. <laughs> uh, so, you know, they can afford somebody with a PhD for college because you can split it 60 ways, but, you know, there's no way that a family is going to be able to, uh, you know, all the families are going to be able to finance this. So I'm going to disagree with Chris a little bit here. I think there is a big resource problem. I think you showed us, you convinced me that it hasn't gotten worse. Uh, and I totally agree that um, there's information problems as well. But I do think that uh, a big problem is a lack of resources, public and or private, in this age of kids' development. Okay, second piece. Gaps open early, but they're not inevitable. Um, you've seen something like this. Here we have child age and years. Uh, these are test scores, above average, below average, parents, uh, in the top fifth of income, their kids. So before we saw what happened at age five, it was flat compared to low income, kids from low income families, flat once they hit kindergarten. But here's how you can see these uh, gaps opening up, okay? Uh, I'm not a neuroscientist, but there's good evidence uh, from neuroscience that uh, Children from low socioeconomic status families, 
children from high socioeconomic families, in the first year of life, their brains look uh, pretty similar. But uh, in the next two years, by the time they hit age three, 36 months, you know, there's these uh, differences in the architecture of the brain. Um, okay, so these gaps open up on achievement scores, cognitive skill, brain architecture. Is it inevitable? Is it genetic? Some people, you talk to them and they say, well, these are different kinds of families, you know, high income families, good folks, low income families, not so good. I would not subscribe to that. I'm just telling you, I've talked to people who've, who've made this argument to me. Uh, if you go to the legislature, uh, people might not say it that way, but that's, I think, in a lot of people's minds. So I think it's important to uh, show a proof of concept that this is not inevitable. Um, and I, I, you've seen a lot of stuff about uh, very comprehensive evidence about the impacts of early care and education programs. I'm going to walk you through this one because this is one I've done work on myself. But I will gladly acknowledge it's a pretty specific, one specific uh, sample. Uh, and I think this is like the gold standard best case. It built off of the Absidarian uh, program. It was called the Infant Health and Development Program. It ran in eight cities around the country in the mid 80s. They recruited families at birth. They were all low birth weight premature kids. Uh, we're going to focus on the high, low, the low, low birth weight kids. Basically, the effects, so that's below two kilograms at birth. The effects uh, were there at the beginning, and then they faded out. But if you look at the high, low birth weight group, uh, the effects were more persistent. And what we did was split it by family income uh, in work with Greg Duncan. Uh, and so what was interesting is they selected on birth weight and prematurity. But they didn't select on income. So a lot of studies select on income, and they only focus on low-income families. This one actually had high and low-income families. Um, it also included uh, transportation. So they had a little bus, short bus, that came around and picked up the 12-month-olds and took them to the center. They actually set up child development centers in each city of these eight cities, hired staff, trained them. Like, this was very uh, rigorous uh, work by them. So this is, this is uh, from a paper with Greg Duncan. Uh, among the high-low birth weight group, if you look at the low-income kids, this line represents the control group. So these are the kids who um, they were recruited, but their coin flip came up tails, so they didn't have access to the home visiting, the two years of, uh, so there was home visiting in the first year, weekly home visiting. So this result here is for the first uh, year. At age 12 months, there was no significant difference. They did a mental development index. It's basically like a, a cognitive development index for somebody at 12 months. Um, no significant effect. Starting at age 12 months, they opened these centers, high quality centers. They invited the treatment group. If you came up heads, you could send your kid to this place, full day, free transportation, high quality. Um, and you could have it for two years. So it went until 36 months. For those kids, um, it had massive effects on these kids' IQ. Okay, Like, this is just enormous. So the. Uh, the kids in the low-income treatment group were outperforming the high-income control group. Okay, so the, the having access to this center, um, and I'm not I'm talking about intent to treat, uh, not just if you took it up, but on average, if you were randomly assigned to have access, uh, the IQs were through the roof for the low-income kids. Uh, what do you think happened later? So they did follow-ups two years after the intervention ended, five years after it ended, 15 years after it ended. There was fade down, but not fade out. Uh, for these kids, uh, two years later at kindergarten entry. So again, it, 
At 36 months, the program stops. Everybody goes back to their uh, community and just does what they can. Uh, but that's still a 0.6 standard deviation effect on IQ, which is enormous. Uh, five years later, half a standard deviation. 15 years later, a little bit more than a third of a standard deviation, but that's not statistically significant. Uh, they lost about a third of the sample. Uh, they couldn't find them or get them to respond. So to me, it's, well, that's the evidence. You make up your mind. Uh, <laughs> what do you think the effects will be for higher income uh, kids? Um, so place your bets. <laughs> there was a pretty big positive effect during the intervention. But it disappeared. It was never significant. Those negatives weren't significant. But they're like what Dale is talking about. Uh, or hers were significant, but she had a much bigger sample. Um, so OK. So we see that. So even out here, two years after it ended, five years after it ended, 15 years after it ended, the low-income kids who had access to this service looked more like high-income control group kids than like low-income control group kids. So you know, having access to this in the first few years of life like shifted these kids who were just a random draw from the low-income sample to be like high-income kids, higher-income kids. Not top um, quintile, but just average uh, above low income. OK, so this is interesting. This is intriguing. The IHDP is amazing for the richness of the data they collected. They have data on every, so many different margins. OK, and so uh, the question is, what drives this difference? Why do we see different effects for kids from high income families versus low income families? Uh, is it due to differential take up of this care? They're all in the same centers together. So that's something to note about this program, too, is that they were mixed income centers because the treatment group was mixed income. Uh, was it the quality and quantity of parental care that was provided, the quality and quantity of other care? Um, you know, is this due to parental taste? How would they react? There's a lot of channels. It's hard to see in most data. But the IHDP is great. Up to 36 months, you can see all kinds of stuff about maternal hours of care, uh, non-maternal care settings, um, maternal labor supply. Uh, so we did some work to try to unpack this. So, um, so we split the sample into sort of mothers who have the lowest third of wage offers based on what we could tell about them, education, age, and things like that. Uh, and what we see is that in the control group, um, they don't have access to the CDC. And they're spending about 67 hours a week in maternal care over the uh, first uh, three years, or I think it's between 12 months and 36 months, so in two years, when the care was available to these folks. So they're spending about 67 hours a week in maternal care and about 21 hours a week in non-maternal other care. If you, if you uh, came up heads instead, you had access to this CDC, and you spent about 16 hours a week in this subsidized, free, high-quality care. What did it crowd out? It crowded out 11 hours a week of maternal care, and it crowded out five hours a week of market-based care, other care. For high-income, for high-wage uh, families, where the mother had higher education, higher uh, wage offer, uh, they took up at basically the same level. So they also took up, on average, about 15 hours a week. So it's not that there was a big difference in take up at all. But what changed was that they, this crowded out less maternal care and more sort of market care. Okay, um, And also, the quality of these two care settings would be different, and we can measure how those things, uh, how they adjusted on those. Um, there are also effects on maternal care quality. 
So if you look at mothers by their potential wage here, and you look at the effect on a measure of maternal care quality, what we see is that for the low, lower wage moms, the quality of maternal care that they provided in the home went up by like a quarter standard deviation. Uh, or uh, I guess at the very low end, it was uh, yeah higher than that. Um, and But the effect on maternal care quality declined with sort of earning power. And uh, so for the high, high education moms, there wasn't much effect. Uh, and so, what, I mean, I, so if you put those two pieces together, like maternal care quality was reduced a lot here, reduced less here, um, and maternal, that was quantity, and maternal care quality went up for the lower income and didn't really change for the higher income. All right, so then the next thing we did, we, like, we have all this, like what economists would call reduced form evidence. Like we can see the treatment effect for these different subpopulations on all these different margins, child development, uh, maternal care, quantity, quality, non-maternal care, quality, and quantity. And so we wanted to build an economic model that would help us interpret this and help us predict what would happen if we offered different kinds of care subsidies or cash transfers. So um, I won't get into all the details. Um, I want to reserve time for the last bit of my uh, talk. But basically, we built an, a model of maternal choice about how to allocate time and money uh, to how much to take up if they have an offer to take up this free care, how much to pay for market care, the costs of market care go up if you buy more of it, if you buy better quality, uh, the cost of maternal care goes up if you provide more of it or if you provide higher quality. The, um, your productivity as a parent is correlated with your productivity in the labor market, so you have different opportunity costs uh, to staying home. And we let the model interpret the data and tell us about how people are trading off these different things. Um, the key thing is that it represents policy. So this, so instead of just thinking about the IHDP as a treatment effect of this bundle, it thinks about the IHDP as an offer of care of a given quality level for a given amount of time, and a maximum time, and you can choose how much to take up. And then you can adjust on all the other margins. Um, so what matters is the quality of care that the child experiences across these different settings, and the parent gets to choose a portfolio of settings, the quantities and qualities. Uh, they're choosing things, they're trading off different things they care about, like how much money do they have left over after they pay for childcare? How much time do they get to do things besides parent and work? How well does their child develop? How much time and effort are they putting into parenting? Um, and how much time are their kids spending in this, in this free place? Math, math, math. Uh, <laughs> they're optimizing. Uh, they're trading off these things they care about against constraints. The kid has to be taken care of all the time. The mother only has so many hours in a day has to cover her budget, she has to earn money or to pay for food and childcare, um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the child's skill gets produced through the quality and quantity of these different care types. Uh, the quality of maternal care gets produced through maternal characteristics combined with effort. Um, okay, so it gives us these, uh, conditions about how people will balance these different things they care about, and then we can use these to interpret the data. And so basically it's saying that people try to balance, when they're choosing how much to work, they balance how much are they going to make and what does that get them in terms of additional consumption or additional uh, childcare time. Uh, they have to choose how much effort to like intensively exert at parenting 
uh, and they have to balance like developmental implications against sort of psychic costs of exerting more effort. Um, and there's a lot more. But um, I just want to give you a little flavor for the model. Um, but what we get at the end is we get estimates of um, how people will react, different kinds of people will react to this offer of a given quality, quantity, and price of care. And what we can then do is ask counterfactual things like, well, what happened? So let's explain the difference in child IQ between mothers with, uh, who didn't graduate from high school versus mothers with a college education. There's a, a gap in the kid's IQ between those two groups. How much of that is attributable to differences in non-labor income between those two groups? Or differences in the maternal wage offer between those two groups? Or differences in like the characteristics of the child uh, early in life uh, at age one? Um, or dif differences in the productivity of maternal care, uh, of the mother in producing maternal care? And these are sort of each one off. And then we say, well, what happens if you adjust all those things? What's left in terms of differences to be explained in terms of differences in maternal tastes? Like, how much do they value uh, child development? How much do they value labor, uh, leisure? How much do they value um, uh, all the things I showed you before? And basically, like, it's all gone. There's not much room left for tastes. It's all basically in these economic environmental constraints that the parent, that the mother faces. Um, and once you account for those, there's little left over uh, for, for tastes. Um, and then the real payoff, though, is when we haven't done this yet, and I promised some of you I would do this a long time ago, but I've been busy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, is like we can do counterfactual predictions for, um, well, we saw what happened if you gave them a full-time high-quality care offer in kind. Like here's a center, you can send your kid here. We can also ask now what would happen if we just offered that part-time? Or what happened if we made it full-time but modest quality? Or, or what happened if we gave you a voucher and let you choose a quality and quantity combination that, um, that you know, had to stay under a certain budget, but you could trade off for yourself how, what the quality and quantity that you purchase are. Or you know, with a quality floor, that's kind of like the early learning scholarship. Cash, we could put in work requirement. Um, and you can see the effects on kids IQ. You can see the effects on maternal labor supply. But you can also see the effects on demand for market care. And you can try to understand how substitutable you know, different kinds of care are and different quality levels um, are. So uh, this, I think, moves us towards better understanding of how are parents going to react to these offers, these subsidies. If you change the price and you offer care at different quality levels, uh, at different prices, different quantities, uh, we need to understand how our parents are going to react to those offers. They're not inert objects. They're, they're going to optimize uh, somehow. All right. Um, the other thing is, uh, this is a separate project, to try to understand the effect of subsidies on supply. Um, we started by trying to measure variation in Minnesota families' access to early care and education services. This is joint work with uh, Liz Davis and Juan Lee, who are here. Uh, just ca came out in ECRQ. Um, and I'll show you some results from that. But you hear a lot about, so we wanted to understand, like, how do these policy subsidies, rollouts, affect families' access to care, affect the market supply of care? the quantity, the quality, uh, the prices. Because if we're going to go to scale, and we're going to do it through public provision, that's one choice. If we're going to do it through scholarships and vouchers, that's another choice. Uh, and actually, Minnesota's doing all of these things in different places at different times. And so we're trying to leverage all that variation to measure the impacts of these 
different subsidy programs on, uh, on access, on supply, and then on families' access to services. So we're in the process of like doing what the OLA um, auditor couldn't do, which is to try to like create a harmonized data set across all these different policy changes uh, that's very localized and says like how many dollars went into this part of the community this year through this program, this part of the community through this year through this program uh, over the last six or seven years. And it's, uh, we've been working on it for a long time. Uh, and it's sometimes we're shaking the gates and it's not opening. Uh, but we're making progress. Uh, and sometimes they open wide. It's great. Um, but you know, we're, doing, oh, we're doing QRIS. We're doing uh, early learning scholarships. We're doing CCAP. We're doing Head Start, Early Head Start, State Pre-K, All Day K. Like all of these subsidies have been changed over the recent years. They all interact with the private childcare market in different ways. They might crowd out, as Dale suggested, public pre-K in-kind provision of pre-K might crowd out the business model of, of a lot of private providers because like infant care is kind of a, a loss leader and then you make it up uh, on four-year-olds. Uh, and so if the public sector takes that over, it might raise the cost of infant care and uh, put private providers out of business. But it might not, might not be a big deal. Uh, it's an empirical question. We're trying to actually develop uh, evidence um, to try to understand how local policy changes relate to changes in local supply. Um, we got all the data from uh, DHS, from all the licensed providers in the state. Uh, we know where they are, capacity and price by child age. We know the quality ratings over time from 2011 to 2017. We also overlaid that with uh, census data on where do families with young children live and uh, what type of families they are. And then we combine that with data on the road network, lakes, forests, like to try to figure out where do families live. And we basically, so here's where all the licensed providers are in the state in 2015. Uh, here's where basically families with young children live in 2015. Uh, and so then what we did was try to measure, we built better measures, distance-based measures of families' access to care. So think about slots per tot, but usually what people do is they just take a zone and they're like, uh, how many slots are in the zone? How many tots are in the zone? You get a continuous measure, maybe you choose an arbitrary thing and you say, that's a desert, deserts are bad, don't want a kid in a desert. Uh, <laughs> No desert, that's good. Uh, but we're actually building like a continuous measure that's more sophisticated, that allows people to shop across boundaries, that allows pe that reflects uh, the spatial correlation between where families are and where providers are. And this is the um, map for the twin for the Hennepin and Ramsey. Um, and so. I'm sorry if you're colorblind. Uh, we were advised that green and red aren't great for some people. But uh, um, So what's cool about it, I think, is that using these dots, basically each dot is where a family lives. So where there's, the dots are dense is where families with young children are dense. And where the dots are sparse, it's where families with young children are sparse. And um, what you can see is like, the green tells you that this is a place where, relative to the number of kids nearby, there's a lot of slots nearby. And the, where it's red, it's telling you that relative to the number of kids nearby, there's few slots nearby. And then we can also use, layer on price data and travel time data and quality rating data to get measures of not just access to ECE quantity, but access to ECE quality and cost. Uh, and we have that for the whole state. We have that for many years. Uh, we can do it by subgroup. We're trying to figure out now how to make it accessible to people through an interactive website. We're not uh, website designers, so if people have ideas, we're willing to entertain them. Uh, 
so in conclusion, um, investment influences child development. Early experiences matter a lot and have a lifetime impact. Lack of investment also has a lifetime impact. These skill gaps that we see in the status quo are produced by parents' choices, but also by our policy choices. And so we have to own that. And we see these uh, outcomes that we're getting, and we have choices. Uh, we are producing those outcomes. I think it's useful to notice that child time is a pr scarce and precious resource. We are used to thinking of it as a burden, but it is a critical once in a lifetime chance to set a strong foundation. And we should recognize that as a scarce and valuable opportunity. And if we miss it, we're, we're uh, dooming ourselves. Uh, lastly, uh, trying to get the policy right demands that we pay very close attention to how parents are going to react to our offers of policy and how suppliers, providers, the market is going to react to. Um, that's what I got. Thanks. So thank you very much, uh, Aaron and Chris, for adding a even richer set of data to the great data we've seen presented throughout the day. Everything from longitudinal studies to Yelp reviews, which is a good reminder that we have a four-star rating here at the Fed on Yelp, thanks to Becca G. So <laughs> Becca G is watching. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with a really uh, maybe straightforward question and then kick it to the audience to, to draw even more from these presentations we just saw. One of the things that's been talked around a bit today, and we've heard some numbers throughout the day, is what the price of quality care sort of should be as a target, perhaps for policymakers or other people thinking about this issue. And I'm curious, in the work you've done on the market, if we should think of that market price that is paid by families with more resources, is that what we think reflects kind of a, a true price of what quality care should be? Or do all of the other confounding factors in the market maybe even sway that in one direction or the other? I, I would say I think it's really important to be clear about sort of the difference between costs and price. Uh, so I would argue that the prices that the the, the prices are too low, or like the costs are too low. We're, we need more expensive care. We need better care. We need higher quality care, and that's not free. Uh, but we, you know, we need to make sure the prices that families face are producing the outcomes that we want them to produce. And that's one sort of lever we have. And um, I appreciate a lot of what Chris said uh, at the end about optimal design of policy. I totally I agree with uh, everything basically you said. I think the, built, just building off what Chris said, I suspect he's right that there are these severe information asymmetries. And if that's true, then we're in a market for lemons kind of situation where we have too much low quality care because high quality providers can't distinguish themselves from low quality providers and can't command enough resources to maintain that quality. And so I would say maybe like costs are too low. Uh, because, you know, we need actually to be spending more than those families are spending potentially. Um, but maybe, you know, that it's probably the right place to start. No, I don't know. I, I mean, I agree. I think um, uh, if, if the market were producing the, the sort of socially optimal level of quality, child care prices, market prices would be a lot higher than they are now, uh, which, which, is, which is why I think if, if we're in a world where QRIS is, is now the primary way we're going to measure, monitor, and increase quality, um, I think we will soon be living in a world where, where I mean, if these systems sort of operate and mature the way we think they should, uh, that, that market prices will likely rise, which, which is why I ended the talk with the, with the discussion of the, of the need for subsidies 
even though I started off my talk sort of painting a, maybe a less dire picture about childcare costs than, than you're used to seeing, because in this sort of world where QRIS is really, really running things in terms of quality, prices will, will rise uh, and we will need uh, 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 a, a strong childcare subsidy regime to sort of you know, catch, catch families, basically. So like the idea that we want to couple better information with more resources, like I'm on board. Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, so we'll turn now to the audience for questions. Uh, we have folks with roaming microphones. And start over here. Um, so two, one comment and then a question. So my comment is um, both of you are focusing on subsidies, and yet we know that take up and use of subsidies is quite low, so at most 17%. Uh, for those that are uh, employment eligible or income eligible. Um, so can you talk a little bit about why you think that they're such an important part of the market, other than the fact that they provide access for a group that wouldn't have it? I mean, so when I think about our policy levers, um, subsidies may, so that was one well, comment. I, the other, hold on, uh, the other question is um, uh, non-standard work hours. Neither of you mentioned the importance of thinking about how our economy has changed and how care is not needed in particular, uh, you know, during standard work hours anymore. And I think uh, child care has been especially slow as a market to respond to that. And, and maybe it's because, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as a challenge for the market. Yeah, let me just, I'm sorry, I, I, I think I um, was unclear. When I say subsidies, I don't just mean vouchers or um, you know, CCDF. I, I would include also Head Start or Early Head Start or State Pre-K. Uh, and when I say more resources are needed, you know, we're, we've been talking all day about childcare or early care and education, but I would also say like any kind of moving resources towards families in this period of life, whether it's health care, whether it's housing, whether it's food stamps, uh, like these have all, EITC, like these have all demonstrated child development benefits. Uh, and so I'm kind of agnostic. When you make childcare cheaper, you're increasing the family's like income, wealth, and you're sort of changing their incentives on the margin to work. Um, and you might not, some people object to that. Some people say, you know, parents should stay home with the kid. Cool, uh, but let's make sure they can and like still keep their home and family together. So that means cash transfers, that means, um, and often those same people don't wanna go down that road. So um, I think, I don't know if that was responsive. So I, I think a 17% take-up rate for CCDF suggests that, that, that this program is not. But, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> is, is the 17%, I thought that was like the funding level. I thought that was the funding level. No, it means that of those that are income eligible, so it's higher if, it's, if you include employment eligible, that it, it means that there are a lot of people that are eligible but don't have that. My understanding is it's way underfunded. There's only so, enough money. So it depends on the state you're talking about, right? So, so some, not all states have a waiting list. So Wisconsin doesn't have a waiting list. Um, and so we can talk about what that means. But uh, it certainly yeah. means that there are, eligible, there are people that are on paper eligible that don't need to use it. I, I think, I, I, so I think there are two problems with the CCDF with, with regard to how important it, it is uh, uh, how important of a subsidy program it is. Uh, number one, the take-up rate is low, uh, 70%. I've done calculations that, su that suggest even lower take-up rates. Uh, number two, I think that there has been sort of mission drift in, in the CCDF over time. For example, in Arizona, um, the, the, the CCDF, you know, in the mid-90s, late, late 90s, early aughts, was a, was a support system for, for the working poor. Um, it is now almost exclusively, the money is actually almost exclusively spent in the child welfare system, as is the TANF grant. So very little of it actually is, is going to subsidize daycare, but rather prop up an entirely different system, 
which is in part why I, I argue that I mean, you can get away with that, I think, because the CCDF is an appendage to uh, a, an unpopular welfare system. And uh, di by divorcing the CCDF, making it a, a standalone program, opening up eligibility regardless of income, regardless of employment status, um, you, you will uh, you will make it a you know the the constituency for it will grow and and uh, it will become more popular. Uh, just a quick plug for a publication Rob and I have coming out in our community dividend uh, online magazine is going to take a look at various CCDF programs in our district and you do see there's a fair amount of variation and why uh, people in different states might be more or less sensitive to some of these issues you're raising. Um, and to call back to a prior comment about thinking about child care, child care in a rural context, we recently took a trip to um, southwest Minnesota where we met with a large employer who brought up this issue of child care and uh, somebody hypothesized that the third shift was actually more attractive to some workers because they wouldn't need child care because they could leave their children at home sleeping while they worked. Um, so it's something to think, I think we need to think a lot about um, more questions. So I just want to make a comment to Chris. I, I, I think the asymmetry of information is an important insight, but I also think we have to be acutely aware that parents are going to high rate their daycare centers because they don't have a lot of choice and it's a defensive move. Mm -hmm. So why would I keep my, my child in a place that's bad, right, if I knew it was bad? And I, I distrust all those evaluations that ask parents that, especially if they don't have any choices. Mm -hmm. So. A f fair point. I, I mean, at the end of the talk, I, I, I mentioned you know, the, that uh, one of the things that needs to happen for QRIS to work, and, and, and you know, there, there are basically two policy approaches for sort of combating the, the information asymmetry problem. One is to regulate the inputs to the production of quality of all states regulate childcare. The other way to do it is, is by way of QRIS. The idea is to sort of reduce the gap in, in what parents know about childcare and what, and what is actually offered at childcare. Um, but in order for QRIS really to work, it, it, uh, parents have to have options available. And uh, we know that that's particularly uh, concerning in, in sort of low income neighborhoods and rural areas. Sorry, question for Dr. Herbst. If we um, were to make the QRIS uh, as high stakes as, as you're suggesting, um, would there be some concern about the sort of corruptibility of that system? And um, what would be some uh, things that could be put in place to mitigate that risk? Can you, what do you mean by corruptibility? So um, my understanding is that the QRIS um, rating systems, uh, there's a huge degree of variability from state to state. Mm. Um, I'm not sure how objective they are, how standardized they are. Maybe the, the sort of goalpost moves from year to year. Um, and if funding were to be so closely tied to the QRIS ratings, um, I, you know, would there be some concern about, about corruption of, of, of those ratings? Suggests that. Uh, if, if you're thinking about corruptibility as moving signposts and changing um, criteria and a lack of transparency about what the process is, I think places are transparent and places move. But you may answer the question. I mean, the one thing that I, <laughs> the one thing that I'm concerned about w with regard to QRIS is uh, uh, that that it is a uh, it, it it is you know. Um, a single number that, th that is a boiled down single number that derives from a large number of individual measures, teacher training, education, ERSs, ratios, and so forth. And as, as Kathy discussed, and, and, I, and I agree with her assessment, if you look at the, if you look at the evidence on, on, on each of the individual effects of those things on quality, 
they don't correlate well to, to quality. And so it, it sort of leaves me and I think others wondering whether a given quality rating really, really sort of is capturing true underlying quality when the individual inputs that comprise the overall score, uh, um, um, again, don't ref there, there's a lot of evidence that they, uh, that they reflect quality themselves. Th and that, that actually is, I think, the most concerning thing. My, I, I think the way, a constructive way to pose this is like, how, if we're gonna put money behind care, if we're gonna subsidize it, we wanna make sure it's high quality. We wanna you know, try to lift the quality. But we have a fundamental quality assurance problem, which is like nobody really knows what quality is, except at the end when kids uh, do great. And just letting parents choose, select into schools and then looking at how they do isn't a solution, full solution either, because there's selection into the programs. And so if some kids come out and are super kindergarten ready and other kids come out and aren't from a different program, you don't know if that's really the program or just selection. So this is a, I think this is the key challenge and the key area we need more innovation. Um, and one way to do quality assurance is through QRIS, and then there's a whole variety of choices about how to measure it. Uh, another way to do it is through regulation of the private market. Another way to do it is through public production, uh, through schools. Uh, Head Starts, are also, they, they're sort of public, but they actually compete out those contracts, and it's pro provi provided by private organizations. So, um, you know, we're, we're used to thinking of Head Start as a public program, um, but it's not that much different than early learning scholarships in a sense because you know, they're subject to market competition for those contracts. Uh, and so the question is more, do we have the competition at the level of the parent? Like, are we using parent choice as a quality assurance mechanism? Is that gonna get us where we wanna go? Are we using like the government um, you know, bureaucrat who's setting up and running the program? Are we using the government bureaucrat who's uh, like monitoring the contract? Uh, and competing out the contract? I don't have great answers, but. but. Yeah, well, I mean, one, one quick follow-up. Uh, QRIS is always gonna do battle with the, with the components of childcare that are not included in QRIS, but which parents care deeply about. For example, I, you know, again, in my, in my Yelp uh, research, what we did was, was basically data mine uh, and try to make sense of, of parents' text-based uh, uh, reviews. And one of the striking findings is, and, and this is not captured in QRIS or, or even sort of, I, I, I don't hear a lot of conversations about this. One of the things that struck, uh, struck us was just how important the customer service features of childcare, uh, how, how important those things are to parents. We're talking sort of billing, the way in which um, how, the, how the, the center visit is conducted, whether they're greeted at the door, whether they're talked to uh, in, in, a, in, in a respectful tone, um, uh, and, and so forth. And what, what we sort of find is that parents in low-income markets have very different ex customer service experiences than, than uh, consumers in higher-income markets. You hear lower-income parents, um, I mean, not, not complaining, but, but, but uh, commenting sharply and negatively about the customer, the customer service features of, of their childcare experience, and that's really salient to parents. So, um, I think we had time for one more question after another quick plug of our community event publication where we also took a look at QRIS <laughs> programs across our district, and to add to that, also heard from a lot of people how important cultural um, practices are in, in parents' consideration of providers and how that might not always be captured by a QRS unless it's a very intentional part of the input process. So with that, our final question before our lovely reception. Oh.
Okay. Um, so, Chris, um, can you just expand a little bit on the comment you made at the end of your presentation alluded to, again, about um, the idea of eliminating income restrictions and eliminating employment, not worrying about that? Because it feels like there's the echoes of the usual, usual universal versus targeted. Um, but can you just talk about what you have in mind and just expand on that a little bit more to understand what you mean? So, uh, although the Child Care Development Fund has changed uh, over time and has become more quality-focused, uh, by conditioning, essentially by conditioning eligibility for child care subsidies on employment, the Child Care De and Development Fund operates as a labor market program rather than a child care child development program. Um, so it, it, it creates strong incentives to be employed, uh, but because it creates strong incentives to be employed, uh, it lessens the incentives to seek out high quality programs because you have to, you have to get into work quickly. Uh, and when you couple that with the information problems in the market, it's not surprising that, that many kids receiving subsidies are in low quality care. Um, so by, by getting rid of the employment mandate and linking eligibility, not with employment, but rather with quality, you're, you're changing the incentives for parents. Ben, can I take one last shot here? Thanks, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> So I think it would help if we define the problem as clearly as we can. Now, I have a strong preference for defining the problem as the achievement gap. Minnesota here, known as the education state, we have one of the largest achievement gaps in the country, if not the largest. Um, if you look at the public return on fixing that problem, as we've argued and James Heckman has argued, uh, probably the best public return we can find. So if you focus on that, on, not on the employment, I'm not even, uh, it's interesting. There's a public return to closing that achievement gap. On the employment problem, I'm not sure that would give you a, a great benefit cost, or maybe something. But if you focus on that, um, then uh, we can look at outcomes as a way to measure quality. And all I mean by that, and this is what we hope to do with Parent Aware here, is look at what percentage of kids does your program get school ready. Mm -hmm. Now, I admit, as Aaron points out, you've got to worry about a little bit about the inputs, but we're basically going to look at kids that come from poverty families. So the outcomes are going to be pretty clear, and we're going to eventually put this on the Parent Aware website, that when you look at the programs in your community, and the scholarships have to be used at four-star rated programs, you're going to see what percentage in that program did the kids get the kids ready. Now you can make your choice based on them, whether you want it uh, music-oriented or language-oriented or Head Start or whatever. But I think it helps at least my perspective, when you get in the policy arena to be very clear on what the problem is and why you're focusing on that problem. Because uh, we've, we, we, we've addressed a number of problems here. Uh, you're gonna, you, know, you get in the policy space and, and you're not gonna have much impact. It's just too diverse, if you will. I think it really helps to make the case for what the major problem is and why there is a public benefit to addressing it. Uh, I think, by the way, Chris, your point on the uh, asymmetric information is brilliant, and I think that's a, a great way to start thinking about um, um, dealing with the, with the quality program. So join me in thanking our moderator and panel. <laughs>